Hello, my name is Dr. Scott Young, and today we're going to talk about hope in the last days. This is Fear of the Future, Part 2, coming right up. So when you have fear, it drives you. Uh, th there, is, there are unique ideas that have come out by psychologists that is a, a fight or flight issue that happens related to fear. And I see that same thing happening in the church. Do you know that? Th that, that fear that comes out, um, people fight about it, they get mad about it, they want to argue on this area. They, um, they flight from it or which just run away so that that response of I just don't even want to talk about it because I don't know what I'm talking about and then there's the discounting people too they, they just want to and that's a part of the fight you know they, they discount it now do you know that there's actually another guy was talking about this one time about the fight or flight idea there is the white hot panic and that tends to happen actually t today because today we walk around with our cell phones looking at this and then someone comes up that is going to hurt us and we walk into that panic mode. And unfortunately, all three of those are in effect for something that's fearful. So I want to, we're going to open up the window of this. So because it doesn't have to be fearful. You have family members I know you're thinking about. And, and it becomes this argument. It doesn't have to be an argument. There are people in your life that I know you think of. And you can, I, I'm thinking about someone, uh, this, uh, this person in my life, that she is definitely a prepper. Um, she believes in an end time. Do you know God talks about her? I know of another person who's just kind of on the edge of Christianity, uh, on the edge of belief. God's got a way for that type of person. But guess what? It's still her choice. And so uh, the whole point of end time issues is to reach humanity. I mean, God's just reaching each person one at a time. I just had a meeting with a, with a friend of mine that I'm going to be bringing on here in the near future. And his name is Steve. And he was talking about he was impressed of the Lord to preach a particular type of message in this church he's at. And he has like about 50 different people. And you think, why would God be worried about the, the 50 different people in the church? Because God is worried about all those things. And actually his message is on hope uh, and, and worry, but, but God, is, God is focusing on the little things and he focuses on the big things. Why would he not be worried about the people around and worry is a little hard harsh statement there he's focused let's put it that way but why wouldn't god be focused on your loved ones like you're focused on your loved ones the answer is he already is so let's go through this a little bit <clears throat> and uh, move forward on my little motion here so we see fear of the future. Now there are theories of the end. And so when you see these, what, what we want to think about is on the top level, we have post-millennialism. Now post-millennialism is, I want you to think in that orange bar, you're going to see the, the first part of, of each of the three orange bars is the now. That's where we are today. Now, post-millennialism thinks about the next step is evangelism. And I hear this all the time, that we can forestall the coming of Christ by our own evangelism. Now, I just want to throw out something to you. There is a really cool theory about uh, uh, the Bethlehem star. <clears throat> I've read books over the years about the Bethlehem star, what it could be, you know, I even read one book that was talking about it was going to be aliens. And this is silliness <clears throat> until Frederick Larson actually came up with a unique way of looking at it. You've got to read his stuff. It's Bethlehemstar.net. And um, <clears throat> what, he, what he found is he took star charts and put, put the person in the right position where that person might be 
in you know, Bethlehem or Jerusalem where they're looking up and, and he saw the star charts back at that moment in time and he searched for those times of when that might have happened. And, and the thing that he said at the very end of it was more telling than anything else because he even searched forward in time up to when Jesus was dying on the cross in April 3, 33 AD. And at that moment in time, he was saying, well, it had to be a, a day with a blood moon, with the, uh, with the Jewish feast that was happening, the Passover. And he's got to find the exact day. And he found all of those. It's so fascinating. And his statement was, is that God had to set up from eternity, from the beginning of time, knowing that this point in time for Jesus's first coming had to be exactly fulfilled. Now, as I said to you before, the Old Testament, if you might have heard this, but the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Jesus fulfills hundreds of prophecies about his first coming. God foresaw it and implanted his son who is also God too, that's the Trinity conversation, right? So if, if we believe that as, as believers in Christ, we know that he foresaw an exact moment in time that he would do that, an exact moment in time when he would go get the donkeys uh, to, to come into to Jerusalem. I mean, all these things, why, why would he focus on that? And we, as the church, could actually change things you see, that's the idea, is that we have, we believe that evangelism, that's what these post-millennials view, viewpoint is, is that they could have evangelism that comes in and that they could forestall the coming of Christ. And then the thousand year reign happens and this is where they come up with this. It's, it's not a purely anti-biblical viewpoint, but it's in spirit, it is a anti-biblical idea. Now we're gonna show you as we go along how there are exact moment in times that God has, has ordained for things, but he hasn't told you exactly when to do those. And so that's what we're gonna show you as we go along as well. So amillennialism, is, it, it's spun in and out of uh, existence over the years. So we work from the now, then we don't basically have a tribulation. Most of these people don't really believe in a tribulation period. They, they think about that there's going to be a final spiritual justice that goes on, but they're really not sure about how it's going to happen. Now, I'll give you an example of what I, I, would, I would say about those kinds of people. That tends to be some of the Jehovah Witnesses. That tends to be um, that, that, that mindset. And, and here's where it came from. You see, in the early 1900s, we had the Jehovah Witnesses that came in and they were saying, you know, there's going to be 144,000 people. And so they were building their, their religion up to that 144,000. But once they passed over that, that plane, they wanted to say, well, here's what happens. You're not going to be the part of the 144,000 because that's already set in stone, but you're at least going to be there on the earth. And so there was this a judgment, a spiritual thing that was going to happen. And they just were anti-biblical. And they kept messing with the scriptures. And this, that's what happens to these people. They pull out little bitty scriptures. I've seen people write a whole book off of one scripture, but they took it out of context. You can write a whole book on one scripture because there's so much depth in there, but you can't take it out of context. And that's unfortunately what a lot of these religions love doing. So that's the amillennial viewpoint. It just doesn't really believe in a millennial reign. Okay, so the millennium is that thousand year period of time. Now, premillennialism is first, it takes the now, and then there's this seven year tribulation period. So there's this period of time in which God is going to set things up and he's setting up this leaseholder idea. And then there's a thousand year reign where Christ is on the planet and he's set things right. Now, Again, this, there are all kinds of teachings about this. There's a, there's a unique teaching um, that, that goes off, and I won't get into the guy because I like a lot of this stuff, but 
This one guy wants to say that our, our dream as Christians is really not heaven, but the millennial reign. And he talks about all the beauty of that. And I'm like, do you understand that the Bible talks about heaven? Jesus in, in, in uh, Matthew 5 and Matthew 6, he says, how shall I explain what heaven's really like? And you can almost see him going, how shall I explain? Let me give you an idea because it, it's hard for, and he uses all these metaphors. You know, when people use metaphors, it's, it's because it's too hard to explain with, the, with the, the verbal word. That's what Jesus was doing. So he used all kinds of pictures for people to understand it. But it was important to him to explain to us. Why aren't we thinking that same way too? Okay, so let's do that overview um, in this. And so you're going to see it on the left side of the screen here. And on the right side, I'm just going to kind of draw out a couple things that we look at. So we have the thousand year reign of, I mean, or excuse me, the seven year period of time. It's separated in the half of it. Okay. So there's a first half and a second half of the seven year tribulation period. There is the rapture of the church. And again, we'll talk a lot more about what that really is about. And then we'll talk about the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. Now I've had people that have asked me to do a, uh, a, a, a organizational chart or excuse me, a timeline on and, and I actually have one. It's over on, on the side over here. And it's something that you can ask for uh, from me. You can call, email me at drscottheretulsa.com and I can get you one of those with that too. But they've asked me, which one do you think comes first before the tribulation? And we'll talk about why I think each one of these are obviously before the tribulation. And, and, and I will tell you this, I've had uh, the pre-tribulation rapture first and then the the uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 war second. And then I've had it, you know, this way. I, I don't know which one happens first. I can see arguments for both way, but guess what? If God doesn't tell you, then it's not something that you need to worry about. That again is why I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the wind. I also don't always spend much time on the house. And you go, why don't you spend time on that? Why isn't that important to you? Because God didn't tell me. I'm not just talking about me. He didn't tell the world through the word. But he does talk about the whys. He talks about the who. Those are very important to the Lord. So therefore, that's what we should be spending time on. Does that make sense? Now, what you have to also see is that at the rapture of the church, there are, no, there's, there's a lot of story. We'll talk about this and we'll go a lot more depth, but, but let me just give you an idea. Do you know that there's a, as many as maybe 700 million Christians in the world? You go, oh, I don't agree with that. There's gotta be a billion Christians. And other people would say, no, maybe more like 300 million. But let me just talk, tell you how I get the stat, okay? Barna Research, B-A-R-N-A, -A, is, is a really unique set of research. It's out of California. This group puts together some great stuff that you ought, ought to be looking at. And they actually asked, they asked this question in different ways, and they came into the churches. And what they did is they said, there are 13 different standards, like, uh, you know, Jesus was uh, born of a virgin and you know, the word is, is true all the way through and all these little things. And what they found is that 9% of those who are going to churches, we're not talking about Unitarian churches kind of thing, but going to the mainline denominations and the other, other types of churches, the non-denominational churches, 9% of the people that they surveyed were actually, would actually agree with all of these points. And I remember when I first heard this, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. But that's what's happened in today. So if there are 7 billion people on the planet-ish, just to do a, for a math challenge boy like me, we're gonna say 700 million people. 
Now again, even if you disagreed with that number and you think it's 300 million, I wanna show you how powerful that number really is. So when we think about 700 million people, no matter how you, how you uh, stack that puppy up, In all of the wars of the world, and see, I, I'm, a, I'm a historian on top of this. I love studying, especially American history, but other histories as well. But World War I, the lowest estimates that it was maybe 10 million that died, the better estimates, I think, are more like 30 million, okay? But let's just cut it in half and say 20 million. It changes the planet from more kingdoms to nation states. It, it changed everything. I mean, do you know that, that uh, blood banks were built because of World War I? Through, uh, through um, Charles Drew actually created the first blood bank because of World War I. He was like, people, appalling number of people were dying on the battlefield because we blood would spoil. And then when we come to World War II, World War I, the seeds of World War I, died, I mean, killed the, the peace that would stay for generations because they wanted to build up the Versailles Treaty. And the Versailles Treaty crippled the economies of the world, and specifically the economy of Germany. And so that dissatisfaction created the seeds for World War II. So World War II is 1932. If you think about Mongolia um, being invaded by Japan, and China coming in around 36, 37, and then in, uh, and frankly, I know that the, the real date is September 1st, uh, 1939, when uh, the, the Germans invaded Poland, but there were already some invasions happening. There were just light levels of invasions that were already occurring. And it ends in 45, so it ends in, when uh, the Americans dropped the, bomb, the two different bombs on J Japan and Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And then finally the people say, you know, we've had enough. And so we have VE Day, victory over, uh, uh, over Europe, which happens early in 45, and uh, VJ Day as well, Japan, victory over Japan. But what, what occurs is that we have as many as 50 to 70 million people that die. Again, a pittance of the number we're talking about here. So even if you want to take the low number that die in those two wars, the maps were changed in the first war versus the second war. And that is an even 10% of the number that will leave the planet in the pre-tribulation rapture. When you get, when you grasp that, I promise you the day that this is, if you want to see this and this is after the rapture, I promise you some things that are actually happening. There's chaos everywhere. Everyone is going to be touched by the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And, and we're going to talk about, again, we're going to come back to the, the, the who and the whys in a little bit. Again, we're not going to spend any time on the winds and the hows because Jesus doesn't talk about it. So I'm not going to worry about stuff he doesn't, he doesn't talk about. So 700 million people, it's going to affect everything. There are going to be theories and thoughts and ideas that are going to be presented to the world. And I believe that's part of the great deception. It's not the only thing that's happening, but it's part of it. So we'll see that happening because more people than died in both of the two big wars. And those are the biggest wars we ever thought of. Now, there are other, other types of things, including events of, of Stalin killing as many as 20, 25 million people in, in, in the Soviet Union. But if you, if you, even if you calculated all of them together, they're not even, what, 11, 12% of the potential that could happen here? It's a huge number of people. Every industry, every situation is going to happen. In my office here, most of the people are going to be gone. 
maybe all of them, okay? You're gonna wanna come into my office and, and get some help with your hearing and yet no one's gonna be here. Uh, that is, that. I mean, that just is one little tiny industry. Do you know that after 9-11, I know of three separate companies that were huge hearing aid, uh, hearing aid private practices that found their downfall because of 9-11 and only 3,000 people died in that. And the, and the, the, uh, the economic down, downturn was gigantic. So we have chaos. We're gonna have, um, we're gonna have economic changes because trash isn't even gonna be taken away. I mean, you had to talk to my staff if, if, the, if the people that, that um, take out the trash every, every night, if they don't come, they're like, oh, nah. Come on, right? Well, what happens if there's no trash pickup ever again? And so this time frame is just gonna be scary in that first little bit. And we see people that talk about that first time frame is gonna be peaceful. I'm sorry, that's, the, that, that's not exactly true. There's gonna be chaos and all kinds of crazy stuff that happens. Now, here's the key element that we wanna spend most of our time on in this first part is the Antichrist. Now, what you have to see is the backdrop of this. John is pulled up in Revelation 4.1, and he's up in the clouds, up in our future, as we talked about last time. He's standing there, and then everyone's trying to open up the seals. And there's seven seals that, that first are talked about. And then John starts bawling like a little baby, and he's like, oh, I can't find, they can't find anyone. John is acting like any one of us might be if we saw that, that event happening in heaven. And the angels are like, dude, get up. Look, the lamb that was slain is worthy. Not just, it doesn't just mean worthy, it means able to do it. He's strong enough to do it. And, and so Jesus goes and breaks the first seal. Now some people say, well, they, they see this white horse and he's got a bow with no arrows that means he's not as powerful as you think he is and he comes to conquer what does that sound like jesus absolutely not don't believe it no matter what you think that's not gog we'll talk about that one in a few weeks that's not magog the, the, the area of the, of the Soviet Union or the Russia now, that's not any of those things. That's not, that's not Jesus coming back on the white horse, which is in Revelation 17, 14. That is the Antichrist. So I want you to realize this. Jesus introduces the world to the Antichrist. Have you ever heard that one before? You go, well, Jesus, He's creating evil? No, he's setting up his plan. The Antichrist just does his plan, Jesus' plan. That should help you out. Because if Jesus loves you and wants the greatest things for you, and has blessings set up for you, you want him to accomplish his plans. My employees who work for me want my plans to come about because I make sure that their plans, they always write goals up, are accomplished. When their plans and dreams are accomplished, they can feed into the business's plan for the good things for them. You see, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. And therefore, the Antichrist only does the bidding of God, not because he's trying to beat people up, but because he's trying to do his work which is turn humanity to God. That's the point. We'll have a very stiff-necked people, you've heard that one before, that will, that will only turn because an antichrist is here. He's the first seal. Then the false prophet shows up. I mean, I think that he is going to be a religious leader. Now, people want to pontificate on that. I mean, is it the Pope? I don't know. I'm not worried about it. I guarantee he's a religious leader. I just don't know what type. Do I know that he is the Pope or I don't know. Then there will be a massive confusion. So you're going to see that confusion happen. Oh, 
makes a bunch of sense if you got 700 million people. I mean, they're going, what happened? The thing that's on the lips of the people will come out because of this. Now, the Left Behind series has, is one of the best pieces of fiction out there. And you might disagree with the Left Behind series, and there's portions that I disagree with it as well. But it, it was groundbreaking. Do you know people came to Christ because of that? My response is like, thank you, Jesus, for that. Now, in 93, 94, when that first book came out, um, cameras weren't like we have today. I mean, I'm sitting here with my iPad, right? And, and kind of working through this. My cell phone, I could pull out my cell phone and I can make videos. I used to do some of the earlier videos on my YouTube channel here by my iPad or cell phone. I mean, people are doing these things called selfies. Now I look at that and go, I, I sorry, I just don't get selfies. That's just me, I don't know. But we have this response of videoing that even Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins could never understand. And they were showing um, people coming out of graves because uh, in, in the pre-tribulation rapture, graves will be opening up. The dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are left here together, this is 1 Thessalonians 4.16, um, will certainly not go before them, but we will meet them in the air and we will be with the Lord forever. And so the Left Behind series didn't have a clue how prevalent there will be of videos happening. I mean, at, 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 there's a wedding, a church, a, 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 an event, something happening and people disappearing all around it. There'll be so much more video evidence than you can possibly imagine. And do you know that on YouTube, there is more content created in one month than as many as 10 years of content on regular TV. Do you think that there might be confusion? Do you think that the Antichrist wants to believe that it's the rapture of the church? And so they're gonna fight against each other over just these kinds of messages. Now what comes out in this first period of time is a unique set of people called the 144,000 Jews. Now, these are young Jewish men. You'll see that in Revelation 14 and Revelation 7. And Revelation 7 introduces them, but Revelation 14 explains them in, in heaven. And we'll get into that, that variation there. But these are young Jewish men who have never had sex with a woman. Really important, okay? Now, here's where the Left Behind series messed this up. Uh, Zion ben Judah, one of their leaders of that, is married man who his family gets killed and, and children get killed. Well, wait a second, you can't have kids. See, that's where it gets a little messy, okay? And, and I pick what the Bible says about this. So I don't wanna go off and my own viewpoints of that. They will have the greatest evangel evangelism of eternity. And there is a group of people I call the chosen. You might call saints that will come to Christ in this time frame, And, and some of you have heard, no one's going to come to Jesus in this time frame because you might have heard in 2 uh, Thessalonians 2, 1 through 10, that the Holy Spirit is taken out of the earth. Well, of course the Holy Spirit's taken out of the earth when the, when, because he's inside of me. But Clearly, not just like a little bit, but clearly people come to Christ in this time frame. And therefore, they can't have Christ in that or come to Christ or have that new revelation of that without the Holy Spirit. So guess what? He is gone for a millisecond or however long it takes before these 144,000 people get out there and they come to Christ and they, they have a unique thing. So these people do a, a work that is a massive work and that's the evangelism that most people don't wanna want, want to understand. That's what the gospels are spending most of their time on. Does, there, does that not mean that we shouldn't have evangelism? You betcha, you betcha. But the evangelism that will happen here is fascinating. So that's when we get to the chosen believers. Now in the first half, 
There's going to be famine, war, inflation, a one world government, a one world religion. There's a one world currency and we already see the seeds of that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And so guess what? This is going to be chaos. I mean, just levels of craziness that you can't possibly imagine. Do you think it's going to be peaceful? Well, you lose 700 million people, you tell me how peaceful it could possibly be in this world. Now, we hit to the middle portion of the tribulation and people go, why do you pull the middle portion out there? Well, because again, it's from Daniel 9.27. And in Daniel 9, 27, in that middle part, he says, there's, there is a, a covenant that's set up with Israel, with many. And uh, some people believe that it's the, the temple. It, it could be a million things that are happening, but it's basically a peace treaty. But he breaks the peace treaty here. And so he goes into the temple, the Antichrist, goes into the temple and causes abomination, with, uh, uh, it's this thing called abomination which causes desolation. We'll, we'll explain that one too. So, and it sets up a really bad period of time where this is the real hell. There is so much hell on earth that happens because of that. Now, so we have, we'll talk about how these aren't even here in this time frame, And then we have this new group of people that are, is the two witnesses. And then we have this interesting viewpoint of, excuse me, of the angel of the Lord. Sorry, let me write that better. So we have the two, the angel of the Lord, the two witnesses, they have a unique message that will happen to that last group of people. The Antichrist will die here in the temple and raise, raise himself. It's crazy stuff that happens. The mark, the beast will happen and it'll be here, but it will be required at this point. And the Jews, the rest of the Jews, not these ones, but the rest of the Jews will run to the hills. In the second half of this time frame, one of the things you have to see is the seals still start here. The trumpets start about here, and the bowls happen about here. But one of the things that I very much disagree when you look at this, and we will get into this, is the seals actually happen all the way throughout. The trumpets start here, and the bowls happen here because there is a concurrent set of events that will happen at this last phase of the time frame. And we'll, we'll go over that as well. So the seals, the trumpets, everything gets worse. There'll be death and a massive global war that two billion people around will die. There will be, there will be some of the most disgusting things that you can't possibly imagine. Your worst nightmare, the worst horror movie will not even get close to it. See, some people believe that they can make it. They can survive through this whole time frame. We'll talk about those as well. And then the, the two witnesses leave, the, the, the groups, um, they, you know, there's all kinds of things that happen related to that. And then Jesus returns at this point here. And this is when he is in the clouds. So Jesus does have, this is not like a, a secret thing. It is and yes, but it's he's coming to take his bride away. And we'll explain why it's important to have the bride go away seven years beforehand. We'll, we'll explain why he comes in the clouds. We'll explain in the millennial reign why he steps on the planet. So then we have the next step of this. So I'm going to kind of erase the board here. So you're seeing it on that right side of the screen, or excuse me, left side of the screen. Okay. So we see the separation of the sheep and goats. And so 
The millennial reign is basically cut up into three basic segments, okay? So there's this first 45 days that you have to see. It's, it's really interesting, it's from Daniel uh, uh, 12, 11 and 12, and it says, you know, the, the person that makes it to 13, 35 days is very blessed. And it's, this is the part of the separation of the sheep and the goats. We will talk a lot about that. I actually have a book about the sheep, the goat, and the brides, uh, the bride. And it is fascinating when you see those groups of people. That's the who that we've been talking about. The who is what God's, God's interested in. And there will be also a resurrection of all the rest of the people. Then the nations, which I call the sheep, will be on the bottom rung from the remnant. Now the remnant is this group of people, these are the Jews, the last third of the Jewish population. The rest of them are killed off in what I call the second Holocaust. And so this place, these people will live upon the planet all the way through. Can I share something with you that's so powerful? Abraham was told, if you, if you read in Genesis, Abraham was told that his seed would be deeper than the sands of the seashore. Now just think about a seashore, if you've ever been by the sea, and you think about his seed, that's the remnant. That is billions upon billions, let's use Carl Sagan in that one, but billions upon billions of believers who not, that's not just, that's not just Christians. That are, that's the Jewish elect in, in, in some sense, some sense of that. That there will be billions of people. Do you know that Abraham was seeing forward in faith in, in Hebrews 11 to this group of people, his progeny? That's really what was happening. They will be the dominant of, of the race over the sheep nations. And that talks about through, through Ezekiel. They will live in a thousand years of peace, and there's a very strong reason we will get into that. Then there is a rebellion, and that's when Satan comes out of the abyss and he creates another rebellion, and there is the white throne judgment. Oops, can't spell today. White throne judgment. And then we have the last resurrection. So the resurrection that I would say, the very last one is for the sheep and the remnant. And then we have the bride and the rest of the people that are in eternity. Why do you think I'm talking about hope? That doesn't sound like a hopeful message. Okay. Do you know that in Revelation 21 and a little bit in Revelation 22, that your destiny is to be in the temple, the Holy of Holies platform, in which you are the glory of the temple. Do you catch that? You know, we always think, well, isn't Jesus the glory of the temple? Of course he is. But our destiny, your final destiny, the remnant, the sheep, the, all the people that will make it through this tribulation and the people that will be in that pre-tribulation rapture stuff, and we'll talk all about that stuff. The final hope, the final destiny is a crazy vision that God has to reconcile all people to him. And he puts them in the temple. That's your final point. My final point isn't to live through the, the, the millennial reign. My final point is to make, just survive through the tribulation. That's not, that's not my point. That's not my dream. It's because my dreams are what Jesus' dreams for me because the word tells me that. If you wanna go deeper in this, 
we're gonna do a lot more depth in here. You can subscribe on the bottom of the screen. I promise you there's so many cool things that we're gonna talk about. We will talk next about the, uh, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. It's a really powerful set of information that gives, that actually shows you, give you this point. Do you know that Ezekiel was bringing up technologies that couldn't have existed at the time? He's gonna, he, he's gonna blow your mind when you see it, when you look at it verse by verse. And so we'll talk about that. Thank you so much.